Mike. Yeah, are we going to meet today at 1.15, Carmelita? Yeah, um, I will, I'll send you the link. Did I tell you that I actually had a student on Friday? It went oh. great. Good. Glad to yeah, hear this it. Is a, this, is a, this is a student who <laughs> wanted to meet. You remember I asked people what day? Yeah, right. So I'm going to meet with her. Oh, each Friday, so broke the ice. Good enough. I have to hear it. I'm looking forward to it. Okay. All right. Talk to you later. I'll send you the link for one o'clock today. Thank you. Hello, Reverend. Good morning. How Good morning, Reverend. Good morning, everybody. Hello. Morning, Keith. Hello. Looks like Jerry Holloway is having a fascinating phone conversation and we can't hear right. a word of it. <laughs> I see Keith Miller there. Um, yes. Oh. I caught the tail end of Carmelita's conversation with Mike. Does that mean that the, um, that the community learning school can be taken to Zoom? Oh. Yes, we. I had my oh. first student on Friday. Can you hear me, Carol? I can't hear anything yet. Does that mean that the, um, I had the first student on Friday, so we'll see who comes today. I sent people the link, so we'll see. You want to come, Carol? Right. I can send you a link. Carol. <laughs> I think some future week that sounds attempting, okay. probably not today. Thank okay, you. great. Don't know who will show up. We'll we'll see. Well, it makes make much more sense to do it on Zoom than like in a masked way because watching people's mouths is so yeah. important when you learn a language. Exactly. Yeah. What language are you learning? English. Oh, English. English. No, 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 I'm teasing. You. Our, stu <laughs> our, our students are learning English. We wanted to do something. Did I the see Jerry Holloway um, teaching Denny Foster how to get on the Zoom link? Mm. Oh. That's what I was doing on the phone. Oh. Oh. Uh, Reverend Lynn, we have a program. During non-pandemic times, Carmelita can explain it more detail, but during non-pandemic times, we have a program where we at the church teach, have a, um, teach English to non-English speakers. Oh, yeah. My husband does that, too. Teaches English as a second language. Yeah. Right. Or it could be a third language. Hmm. Could be. Yeah. Hi, Carmelita. Hi, 
Hi, Michael. I can't see you, but I hear your voice. Yeah. Hi. Hey. Good morning, Lynn. Good morning. Who said that? I did. I did. All the way from Morton Grove, Illinois. Oh, that's my brother, Lon. Hi, sweetie. <laughs> I, don't, I don't see you. I just see your name, but that's cool. Can you see me? Yes, I'm hiding under the bed the same way I used to when we were children. <laughs> My little brother, yes. Hmm. Don't get him started. No stories. <laughs> All right, I'm I'm self muting. How's the weather in Chicago? Sunny, just uh, like you. <laughs> Bye now. Gosh. No, don't mute yourself. We want to hear all about her. <laughs> yeah. How long's this service? <laughs> yeah, I'm far away, but I can still get to him. <laughs> I have three powerful, loving, wonderful sisters. I'm blessed. <laughs> yeah, you say that now. When you were little, you didn't say that. <laughs> well, I assume now I'm being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> does make all the difference in the world. <laughs> Here he is. Hi, John. <sighs> Sabrina gives us the warning. Yes, recording is on. <laughs> and live on Facebook. <laughs> oh, dear. Don't tell me that. I never look at Facebook. But Facebook looks at you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Could somebody tell me what group I'm listening to? <laughs> Branch Unitarian Universalist Church. Oh, good. <laughs> Marie Gore, I recognize the voice. Yes. <laughs> I'm trying Hello, to get it. Hello, Marie. There she is. Hello. <laughs> Marie, it's so good wonderful. to hear you. Okay. Thank you. Thank and you. And in fact, <laughs> it's time to get started. I'm, I'm trying to find a picture on Facebook, but it's not coming up. A live picture. Okay, everyone, um, we're going to mute everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Paint Branch Unitarian University. Sabrina, you muted. You're muted as well. You need to, I mean, Susanna, you need to unmute yourself. Okay, I believe everyone else is muted. Good morning, we're going to get started now. David is going to play music for us that is an improvisation on some science themes inspired by three composers, Hector Villalobos, Ernst Toch, and Alfred Casella.
Wow, David. Thank you, David. Welcome to worship at Paint Branch Unitarian Universalist Church. We acknowledge that the land on which our church stands is part of the ancestral grounds of the Piscataway people. I am Susanna Schiller, one of the worship associates who plans services in collaboration with church staff. I'm happy you chose to be with us today. If you are using Zoom this morning, please run your cursor around the perimeter of your screen to find the microphone icon and be sure to remain muted throughout the service so we can hear all the speakers and David's piano clearly. By moving your cursor around the edges of your screen, you may also find the option for switching between gallery view and speaker view. Clicking on the bubble icon opens up the chat screen where you can read timely messages during the service. Right now, I invite you to type into chat how many people are viewing from your screen. Please type one if it's just you. Later in the service, you will be invited to use the chat feature to post your joys and sorrows. At the end of today's service, you will have the option of joining a small chat group in a breakout room by staying on Zoom. Did you know that Paint Branch has its own YouTube channel? All of our online services from the past two months are posted there. Go to YouTube and search for Paint Branch Unitarian Universalist Church and you will find them. Just like our other services, today's is being recorded. I have two announcements this morning. First, the nominating committee is encouraging members to serve our Paint Branch community on the Board of Trustees, the Legacy Fund, and the nominating committee. To suggest a candidate or indicate your own interest, please contact the members of the nominating committee, who are Carmelita Carter-Sykes, Carolyn Byerly, Karen Donovan, and Jackie Walpole. Elections will be held at our annual meeting on June 6, 2021. Our second announcement is that you are invited to come to practice. Immediately following this Sunday service, please join us in the main room to discuss what exactly we come to practice at Paint Ridge. This is a brainstorming session and we want to hear from you about what you come to practice at Paint Branch and what you'd like to practice. Attendance is easy. Simply decline the invitation to join a breakout room after the service to stay in the main room for this fun informal coffee chat. And if you can't make it, please submit your ideas for what we come to practice to Chris McCann at dmre at pbuuc.org. Hope to see you. Now, Reverend Strauss will lead us in a call to worship. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. It's wonderful to be with you on this beautiful spring day. We all have much joy and much sorrow in our lives each day, each week. And being members of a congregation belonging to a UU congregation or any church or mosque, temple, it brings with it the joys and sorrows of the community. And so we hold today all the joys and sorrows of each of us individually, of our families, and of our church family, which is always going through change and adjustment. And in that spirit, I offer our call to worship words from Lao Tse. If there is to be peace. If there is to be peace in the world, there must be peace in the nations. If there is to be peace in the nations, there must be peace in the cities. If there is to be peace in the cities, there must be peace between neighbors. If there is to be peace between neighbors, there must be peace in the home. If there is to be peace in the home, there must be peace in the heart. If there is to be peace, there must be peace in the heart. May it be so. Let us celebrate life together on this day. Amen. 
I would like to invite you all to take a moment to greet one another with waves and smiles because we're still separated in our little boxes. So we wanna break out and as we do that, um, we'll stay muted. So just move around with, with energy and scroll through the pages. There should be three. So wave at page one and then move on to page two and wave and smile, hello, hello. And then wave and smile to page three. Yay, it's so nice to see you moving, to see us moving together. Thank you for being here. And now Don Gerson will light our chalice. We light the chalice to celebrate Unitarian Universalism. This is the church of the open mind, the helping hands, the loving heart, and the radiant spirit. Encendamos esta caliz para celebrar el Unitarianismo Universalismo. Esta es la iglesia de la mente abierta de las manos amigas, de amor, del corazón y del espíritu radiante. Thank you, Don. Now, let us join together in singing the hymn, Gather the Spirit. Please keep yourselves on mute. Good morning, my good people. 
I'm Chris McCann, your religious educator, and it's a joy to be gathered to celebrate once again. This morning, I'm going to show you part of a video on gene editing. I'm going to attempt to do that. So be patient with me as I share my screen. Um, it's a tough co concept for me to wrap my head around. And I found that this video was an accessible entry into a complicated topic. And I hope you'll all find it helpful too. What is gene editing or genome editing as it is also known? And how does it work? Let's start by talking about genes. These are sections of the long DNA molecules coiled up inside each cell of every living thing. From microorganisms and insects, to plants and animals, including humans. Think of DNA as the instruction manual for an organism. In people, genes can influence characteristics such as your height and the colour of your eyes. DNA is inherited from our parents. We have a combination of two sets of genes, one from each parent, brought together to produce a new set of instructions and reshuffled in each generation. But sometimes these instructions carry errors, and these can create problems. Faulty genes can cause serious illnesses. Humanity has a long history of figuring out ways to modify genes. We have been crossbreeding plants to make them better to eat for thousands of years. But with gene editing, we've made a great leap forward. This increasingly accurate new technology is faster to use, relatively simple and cheap compared with previous methods, and promises huge benefits. In a nutshell, it works by identifying then cutting pieces of DNA. One way of doing this uses a component known as CRISPR to pinpoint the precise DNA sequence within the gene to be altered. Then an enzyme called Cas9 snips through the DNA, changing it or allowing it to be replaced by another stretch of DNA that is introduced at the same time. This can either replace a faulty gene with a healthy one or change a gene to make it behave differently. The methods act like a find and replace for the genetic instruction manual. By making these microscopic changes to DNA, gene editing has the potential to make big changes to our lives. So now we're all experts, right? We all know what gene editing is all about. So I shared this video during yesterday's family worship and we had a wonderful conversation about the benefits and drawbacks of gene editing. We learned about a genetically modified grain called golden rice that is drought resistant and contains beta carotene, which would be beneficial for areas experiencing famine. We learned that at the Patuxent Wildlife Refuge, there's an attempt to modify the northern ash tree to resist a disease that is decimating the northern ash population. Our worshipers agreed that these were good uses of the technology and that uses like curing cancer would be for the good overall. The general consensus of our worshipers is that the idea of designer babies and pets freaks them out and that using genetic modification in this way runs a significant risk of eliminating diversity. We discussed how science has been misused, particularly when it involves traditionally marginalized people. Our worshipers were concerned that in the wrong hands, gene editing could lead to eugenics. We wondered what could happen to ensure that this technology remained in ethical hands, and Carmelita recommended that our kids run for office when they're eligible. So can I get an amen on that, everybody? <laughs> the kids were not nearly as excited as the adults at this idea, but they did agree that public social activism and conversations with their peers was something that they could manage from their current place in their leadership journey. Our kids are amazing, y'all. And now Susanna Schiller will take us deeper into this topic. I got excited when I learned that today's sermon would be about gene editing. I spent my career at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, an agency in the Federal Department of Commerce that focuses on helping the US economy through measurements. As new technologies are created, NIST develops measurement techniques to enable them to be produced widely. 
Think about your iPhone and how much more computing it can do than a room-sized computer could do decades ago. That's possible because computer chips have gotten smaller, which was only possible because our ability to measure length has also gotten more accurate at a very small scale. That's something that NIST played a part in. NIST creates things called standard reference materials, which scientists around the nation use to make sure their measurements are accurate. For the first 10 years of my career, I worked on these standard reference materials, ranging from cholesterol in human serum to ensure that the blood tests your doctor's orders are accurate, to vitamins and minerals in infant formula, to ensure that food nutrition labels are accurate, to the amount of lead in paint samples to help remediate lead paint in public housing. It's incredibly exciting to know you're contributing to a technology that will help people all over the US and even around the world. One of the newer areas that NIST works in is biotechnology, which is becoming essential to products and services in sectors ranging from healthcare to energy to electronics. Among other work, NIST developed a measuring stick, quote unquote, for the human genome to help ensure genetic tests are done accurately. So how does this all relate to today's topic? As the video that Chris just showed said, humanity has a long history of modifying genes. Think crossbreeding plants or dogs. There are ways to edit the genomes of some plants and animals before CRISPR method was unveiled in 2012, but it took years and cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to make those modifications. CRISPR has made it cheap and easy, and it's already used widely for scientific research. CRISPR has been already been used to grow rice that accumulates lower levels of potentially toxic heavy metals. And it's being used in an experimental technology to treat patients with sickle cell disease. CRISPR technology has the potential to overcome the lengthy time lag of developing preventive therapies by significantly accelerating the development of vaccines. In traditional vaccine development, a version of the virus is introduced to stimulate the development of antibodies in a type of white blood cell called B cells, which are then injected into the patient. With the CRISPR technology, the B cells can be engineered much more quickly and don't require exposing patients to the live disease itself. The technique CRISPR-Cas9 was discovered by two women scientists, Jennifer Doudna and Emmanuelle Charpentier, who received the 2020 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for it. It acts like a pair of scissors that can snip parts of DNA strands after cutting, the repair of the DNA code enables it to be altered. It's called genome editing or gene editing. But usually the results are not as precise as that term implies. Think of it like using scissors to edit a newspaper article by cutting words out of the paper and moving them around. Not surprisingly, scientists are working hard to improve on this technology. My former federal agency, NIST, has a partnership with Stanford University that is actively involved. In fact, they are part of a team that has developed a new kind of CRISPR platform that's more precise. It's called Majestic. Instead of editing with paper and scissors, this new technique is more like using the find and replace function in a word processor. Biotech is here to stay. I'm proud to have been a part of a federal agency that is working to ensure the tools for it are accurate. But we still have the ethical questions surrounding what the technology is used for. And I'm excited to hear what Reverend Strauss has to say about that. And now Lynn Lewison will lead us in our joys and sorrows. Good morning. My name is Lynn Lewison, 
and I am a pastoral care associate here at Paint Branch, along with Kathy Bartolomeo and Jim Flaherty. As we gather in community, we carry life's hurts and its great joys. And we think it is still helpful to provide an opportunity for attendees to share these joys and sorrows. So during this online service, I invite you to share your joys and sorrows in the chat. And I will lead a meditation after the intonation. And now David Chapman will play Truth from Game of Thrones by Ramin Dewadi. Dewadi. Thank you, David. That's beautiful. Now let us take a few minutes to acknowledge all that has been shared 
as well as those joys and sorrows that remain unshared and yet are on our minds. In this quiet time, may our hearts be open to hope and healing. May our minds open to hope and possibility. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Chuck. That was, David, I mean, it was beautiful, that piece of music. And I started too early, so I will <laughs> wait for the silence. May we hold these and one another in love and kindness so that this congregation may be a source of strength and comfort, courage and hope in the days and weeks ahead. Thank you, Lynn. <clears throat> Thank you, David. Thank you everyone for sharing their joys and sorrows and for being here this morning. So speaking of it is so important for us to be speaking about the ethics of gene editing, genome editing. And thank you, Chris, for the, sharing that video and the kids' responses. And, and thank you also, Susanna, for your reflection and sharing. If we were in the sanctuary together, I would ask, and we can do this now if you wish to raise your hand. How many of you have ever done the um, 23andMe or the, um, what's the other, the other um, where you can send in some DNA and find out your legacy, your, where your family's from and so on? How many have done that? A few, a few. I know I have not. I do think it's really important for us to learn about science. And I am not a scientist and I am not an ethicist. <clears throat> but I have had a very interesting week reading up on it all. And the major book that was a resource was a book by Walter Isaacson on, um, called The Cold Breaker. But there are many new books coming out right now on this topic. Natalie, Professor Natalie D'Souza of the Institute of Molecular Systems in Zurich, Switzerland, reviewed four recent publications on gene editing. And she writes, we are now able to make deliberate choices about the genome we pass on to our children and by extension to the species. Two main factors are at play here. First, we know a lot more than ever about how genes shape us. And second, the technology for making precise changes to the genome is maturing quickly, most notably with the gene editing tool CRISPR, which stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. The CRISPR is a lot easier to remember. What is radically new is that we begin to have the option to change the human genome deliberately. For better or worse, our species can turn an exorable will to control nature back onto itself. Eventually, we could guide human evolution. Wow. Does that mean we should? These are big, big questions. 
In my early 20s, I used to get big ideas. At least I thought they were big. They would come to me in a burst of excitement. I would think, wow, wouldn't it be great if, and just imagine if only we could, and all kinds of ideas would come to me like it, I thought I maybe should become an inventor. These ideas were so stimulating. But then in the very next moment, I would think, nah, if it's such a great idea, somebody's already done it. Somebody's already invented my great idea. And I would shut my imagination down and laugh about it and go on. Is it just me or is there some combination of grandiosity and humility that rules the world? We would be king or queen or both, or we are without worth, useless, too small to matter. So I'm focusing in my remarks on imagination and humility. When we shut down our imagination, what gets lost isn't just the seed of a good idea or the joy that imagination can bring. What we fail to see, we individualists, we you, you extreme individualists, what we fail to see is how we fit into the big picture, how we are worthy because we are both small as a seed and big as a sunrise. That's what it means to be human, big and small. We fail to see how one big idea, one invention, one discovery leads to the next. Step by small step, one discovery leads to another. That's an important part of the story of genetic mapping and gene editing. It's been happening since the 1950s, probably started before that. One big idea and one small step at a time, and that's how we got here today. That's how humans have developed the ability to change and alter ourselves. No single idea, no matter how big, could have brought us to this moment. No small step for humankind could have done it. This astonishing capacity for gene editing required a global village to accomplish and decades of research and failure and hope and trying again and trying again. Hours and hours in labs across the US, South America, Europe, Scandinavia, Australia, China, Africa, scientists across the globe, each pursuing one big idea after another. When Doudna and Charpentier worked on CRISPR technology, one worked through the day in their lab in California and sent that day's findings across the miles and time zones to, their, to her colleague in France. And thus the work went back and forth 24 hours a day. This kind of collaboration also took place recently this year as scientists across the globe worked on COVID testing research and the race for vaccines. Albert Einstein wrote this about research don't you love to be able to quote Albert Einstein? He wrote, concern for humanity and its fate must always form the chief interest of all technical endeavors. Never forget this in the midst of your diagrams and equations. Concern for the fate of humanity. Many amazing things have happened in the brief span of my lifetime and yours. Walking on the moon is only one of them. A US president who is black was only one of them. Home pregnancy tests, in vitro fertilization, two more of them. Chemotherapy and healing medication for HIV, two more. Approved vaccine for our current virus were ready in mere months and many of our arms have been inoculated in less than a year. With continuing development of microchips, humans have learned to see life from the inside out. With the miracles of microbiology, discoveries in all the sciences have sped up. We are surrounded by things we could barely have imagined, vaccines for hepatitis B, HPV vaccines for children and teens, vaccines for shingles, advances in treating blood diseases with human stem cells. We have lived, are living in a time of rapid change. 
We are living during a scientific revolution, a biotech revolution. So let's pay attention. First, we live through the technology revolution. What did you carry in your pocket or purse in 1965? What was always on your nightstand when you went to sleep? A clock radio, perhaps? Now you don't leave the house without your cell phone. I get excited by science, by archaeology, by ancient dinosaurs. I get excited by astronomy, the billions and billions of galaxies that I can't see. Both nurture and nature interest me. Mine is the first generation of mothers to save ultrasound pictures of their babies in utero, to have information about their child before holding them in their arms. I have to admit that I still imagine things. I still ask big questions and wonder a lot. I sometimes see things that aren't really there. Does that ever happen to you? I think of it as, you know, something like that poem about feathers, that hope that Emily Dickinson saw at a slant. That way of seeing, I still see things. Once I preached a sermon titled, I saw Jesus walk on water. It drew a crowd, I can tell you that. <laughs> that wasn't the exact title, but that was close enough. I can still remember the sighting, however. I was walking on the path that I walked on frequently and I was approaching the reservoir on a cold Tennessee morning. In the early morning light, I saw a figure all dressed in white walking on the water toward me. I swear it could have been him, but really there was nothing there. <laughs> Don't give up on your imagination. It can bring hours of enjoyment. Stay open to amazement and remain humble about what you know and what you don't know, or what you think you know. Even the scientists imagine things that they could not yet see. CRISPR technology sparks another kind of wondering in me, in us all, a what if curiosity. Many of, the, of us have stories about this exciting question, this what if question. Do you wanna know if it's a boy or a girl? How many remember being asked that question in the doctor's office? Some of you may not realize what a radically recent question that is. There are many more radical questions to come. It's not too soon to begin thinking about what comes next in genetic possibilities. Think about this. If you could choose to undergo a painless, free, fully accessible to everyone opportunity to edit your genome, just yours, in just one way, would you do it? And what would you choose to change about your biological self? Blue eyes instead of brown, taller by three inches, yes. curly hair, straight hair, or just more hair? The core ethical dilemma of the coming possibilities in gene editing is the issue of therapeutic versus enhancement changes. The choices I offered about eyes and hair and height, these are all enhancements. They don't promise better health. They don't save lives. They don't forward the human race. Beginning with the discovery of the double helix form of DNA, first imagined by Watson, Creek, and Rosalind Franklin in 1953, to the groundbreaking CRISPR-Cas9 research in 2012, ethical concerns have also been on the forefront. In 1974, ethical concerns of genetic engineering led to the National Academy of Sciences to call for a moratorium on genetic research. 1974, that's a while back. Scientists saw the pace of biotechnology increasing and they began to worry. A moratorium was called, research was halted for about a year. Paul Berg led a conference of 100 scientists at the Alcillamar Conference Center in California. And there they carried on discussions 
of the fears that were arising, the concerns, including eugenics, superbugs or other unintended consequences, the ethics of using animals for transgenic experiments, the costs, where the funding and affordability, lack of systems of equal access and distribution of treatments and therapies were a concern, the kind of unequal access we're seeing now during COVID. The scientists were worried. They applied the breaks for a year and then they hammered out ethical guidelines that prioritize the potential for curing disease, not for enhancement. The principle of do no harm while using the biomedical advances available to help relieve pain and suffering within agreed upon boundaries. The primary boundary being therapeutic use, not enhancement. These guidelines were expected to be followed in the international scientific community but there are still no really binding global agreements and few laws. Within therapeutic applications, there are two types of gene editing. One addresses the disease in a single individual and seeks a therapy for healing that person. The other is germline genetics, which edits particular locations on the genetic code to remove a mutation from an inheritable gene. In genetic-specific inherited diseases like sickle cell, Huntington's, and others, many scientists agree that when there is no other effective therapy possible, it may be immoral not to use what we know to save future generations in a family from a painful, incurable, life-threatening, life-shortening disease. <sighs> A full exploration of the philosophy of ethics and morality on the issues of genetic research would certainly take another sermon or two. One clarifying definition suggests that ethics addresses one person's choice for themselves based on their own decision of what's right or wrong for them. And moral choice relates more to the welfare of the whole community. What choice benefits the good of the whole rather than the one person making the choice. Many of our families, in many of our families, we have loved ones with chronic disease, disabilities of various kinds, mental illness, who live with varying degrees of pain and suffering. How much pain is too much? Who decides? Where are the red flags? Who regulates? Who profits? Who defines disability? or the degree of acceptable pain. Is fairness possible? There is a need for societal consensus on guidelines and regulations. How do we get societies to agree? Do we want to risk designing a less diverse human species? <sighs> How do we prepare for the next steps in the scientific revolution? Einstein also wrote, I sometimes feel that I am right. I do not know that I am. There are many questions ahead. I encourage us all to hold on to big ideas, hold on to passionate curiosity and imagination, and most of all, hold on to humility. Remember, we are but small seeds and we are also as big as the sunrise. The time for learning about gene editing is now. We must determine not only whether we think it right or wrong to alter the genome and direct human evolution, but also how in our societies where power is concentrated and trust is weak between the few who decide and the many who bear the consequences. The challenge is building a global and local way to enable a consensus. It is time to begin to study this complex set of issues and to use our power for good, just like Dr. Fauci would want us to do. May it be so, amen. And now I think, is it Spirit of Life come next? No. All right. Next um, we, Lynn, next we will sing, now let us sing, hymn right. number 368. 
I knew there was music. Yes. Thank you. Now we will sing. Now let us sing. always makes me feel so happy. Our church depends upon the financial support of our members and friends. Please give as generously as you are able. This Sunday's offering can be received as indicated in the chat bar. You can make online donations through Breeze or by text, and you can still mail donations to the church office. The offertory music today is She Blinded Me with Science by Thomas Dolby. Thank you, David. Wonderful music. I was looking forward to it and it was just perfect. So inspiring and energizing and so appropriate to our topic. Thank you so much. As we move in the global community toward reconciliation and consensus, so we move that way within our community of church and within our families. So I'm offering as closing words, the words of Lao Tse, if there is to be peace. If there is to be peace in the world, there must be peace in the nations. If there is to be peace in the nations, there must be peace in the cities. If there is to be peace in the cities, there must be peace in the neighborhoods. If there is to be peace in the neighborhoods, there must be peace in the home. If there is to be peace in the home, there must be peace in the heart. 
Let us find peace in the heart as we struggle with the questions of our times. May it be so. And now let us sing together once more the spirit of life. And now Don Gerson is extinguishing our chalice. Okay, as a reminder, if you're interested in a coffee hour, select a breakout room when you're invited. And if you would like to stay for the come to the practice brainstorming session this morning, decline the invitation to join a breakout room and stay in the main room. <laughs> 